My lecture this afternoon is entitled, Is There Such a Thing as a Skyscraper Curse? And I'd like to begin by handing out my new business card for the book that I wrote last year, The Skyscraper Curse. Pass this around. I didn't realize how many people were going to be here today, so I might be running short of cards, but I have more of them in my office that would be available during office hours or, or some other time. I came to graduate school at, at Auburn University because I really liked the, Aus the Austrian business cycle theory. I discovered it when I was an undergraduate. The economy was in a depression and eventually I would read Murray Rothbard's great book, America's Great Depression, which I can highly recommend to everybody. It's still a great contribution amongst many of his contributions in so many different areas, as you've seen this week. Then I got to Auburn University. I'd met Roger Garrison, the Austrian macro theorist, who first told me about the Austrian business cycle theory. And so I thought, that's great, you know. And then I found out that the senior macro professor at Auburn University considered the Austrian business cycle theory a grisly embarrassment. <laughs> and so that's when I decided to do my dissertation on prohibition, basically. Um, and so I'd given that up. And uh, then in 1999, I got a job uh, as a macro economist at Columbus State University. And it was then that I discovered the skyscraper curse. It was published in an editorial in Investor's Business Daily. And basically what the writer was saying was that there was this association between the building of a world record-setting skyscraper and an economic crash. And that appeared in all the major business media of the day, and most of them just simply laughed it off as something they could write up for today's story. However, I saw the Austrian business cycle theory embedded in this skyscraper curse. So, I began to study that association, and I finally was able to publish an academic paper on the subject in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics explaining this correlation between the skyscraper curse on the one hand and Austrian business cycle theory on the other. And then on August 7th, 2007, I wrote a blog post on Mises.org, quote, quoting myself, there is a new economic record setting skyscraper in the ma making in the United Arab Emirates. The skyscraper curse predicts economic depression and or stock market collapses to occur prior to the completion of the skyscraper. So I've already explained what the skyscraper curse involves. Andrew Lawrence was the writer who first developed this association. He focused only on record-setting buildings. And but basically, he described the curse as record-setters are typically completed and opened during an economic crisis. And so this is not about normal business cycles. It's not about overall construction uh, or investment statistics. But let's go back and examine the history of the curses. The first set of record-setting uh, skyscrapers were the Singer Building. They used to make um, sewing machines. And the Metropolitan Life Building, which, of course, they sell insurance. Uh, those were both started uh, in 1906 and they were both completed roughly in 
1908, the Panic of 1907, which was a significant event. It's not usually talked about very much, but it's the justification for the Federal Reserve Act and the founding of the Federal Reserve in 1913. So it was a, it was a big issue. Then the Woolworth Building was built and completed in 1913. Uh, but Andrew Lawrence thought there was no curse associated with this, so he considers the Woolworth Building to be a mistake. During the Great Depression, 40 Wall Street, which is now Trump Tower, the Chrysler Building, and the Empire State Building were all started prior to the stock market crash and all opened uh, after the crash in the beginning of the America's Great Depression. 1973 crash in crisis, the World Trade Towers and the Sears Tower uh, were begun before that and both set uh, new world records at over 100 stories. And this uh, eventually resulted in a stock market crash and the whole decade really from 1971 through 1982 was called the Great Stagflation. And as I mentioned, I was in college when there was a depression. That was 1980 through 1982. America had uh, several months where the unemployment rate was greater than 10% and where the inflation rate was over 10%. Uh, and interest rates were over 15%, if you can imagine that. And then at the turn of the century, we had an interesting situation here. The, the um, financial, the Asian financial crisis occurred in 1997, uh, which was in line with the building of the Pat Patronus Towers in Asia. And then we got the stock market bubble, and then Taipei 101 was constructed and opened in ta Taiwan. And the interesting thing about this particular cycle was that the bubble originated in Asia, uh, the, and it was a technology bubble. And then when the financial crisis hit, which was really a currency crisis, the technology bubble transferred itself from the Asian tigers of Southeast Asia to Taiwan. Sorry about that. It was President Trump calling. I just can't take that call. <laughs> um, and so the technology bubble that was in Asia was transferred both to Taiwan to the north and to the United States. And it was because of that currency crisis that occurred in 1997 in places like Vietnam and Thailand and so forth. And then we have the housing bubble and the financial crisis which coincided with the building of a new world record-setting skyscraper in the Middle East, um, and it was called the Burj Khalafi in Dubai, uh, setting a new world's record. The Kingdom Tower is yet another new record-setting skyscraper that's being built uh, in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, and the construction has been delayed for quite some time, uh, but that doesn't really matter too much in, in terms of the skyscraper curse itself. So skyscrapers and business cycles, this is where I went in and analyzed why, how in the world just building a single building could result in a severe business cycle. So I provided the links from the curse to the theory and basically artificially low interest rates cause three different Cantillon effects, all of which, if you're reducing interest rates below the market level, uh, all three of these fact effects will result in people wanting to build higher. And those are termed Cantillon effects after the first economic theorist, Richard Cantillon. Um, basically, he was the first person to describe economic theory uh, in a very complete and comprehensive way. So lower interest rates causes 
land prices to increase. Does that make sense? It's something that every, everybody in real estate, for example, knows that's the case. As you lower interest rates, you lower the opportunity cost of land, and so the price of land increases. Now, what impact is that going to have? Well, if you lower interest rates and land prices go up, then any entrepreneur or any developer has to consider that to, to pay that higher price of land, you're going to have to build more space to rent. Okay, so, uh, and we see this in Auburn uh, today with the t last 10 years being basically near zero interest rates, uh, the building of buildings in town uh, has obviously gone up. If you look around town, you see the old buildings uh, in downtown, they're typically one or two stories tall. Uh, but now the ones that are under construction are actually six or seven stories high and then four stories below our parking decks. So, uh, and then there's one building that was built uh, during the housing bubble. It's the large white building that's five stories, no underground parking. And uh, it was built right before the uh, housing bubble crashed uh, and under similar circumstances. Lower interest rates increases the size of companies. This is something that you may not be familiar with, but it's something that people who work in industrial organization well understand. Okay, and the idea here is that with low interest rates, companies can engage in mergers where two companies combine to become a bigger company, acquisitions where a large company buys up smaller companies in order to become bigger. Uh, under normal conditions, companies would grow uh, just by growing their business. But with interest rates are low, those low interest rates or the cost of acquiring companies or merging with co companies goes down. And so you'd see a different type of economic growth pattern uh, as a result. And anytime interest rates are low, you see lots of mergers and, and acquisitions, which we've been doing the last few years, actually, along with general economic expansion. And the third, uh, well, let me back up to the second one. Uh, if you have larger companies, you also have the demand for large amounts of office space in the central uh, business district. Okay, if you think of a, a lot of mom and pops out there operating, you know, they do their own accounting and they do their own ordering. Uh, you know, the, everything is done by mom and pop, basically. But as companies in that particular industry get bigger and bigger and bigger, all of a sudden you need offices for accountants, you need offices for managers, uh, for whoever's in charge of the company, uh, you need a boardroom for the, uh, the board. And um, so all of those features that mom and pop do in a business now have to be done by specialists uh, working full-time on a particular area. So you have a marketing department, an HR department, and as a result, all of those uh, people are going to be located in a corporate office building in a central business district. So, also uh, lower interest rates, uh, result in Cantillon effects in the sense that they create new construction technologies and new building systems. Okay, so these are some more technical aspects of this process, uh, but basically what you see is that you have to come up with new ways of constructing buildings. You have to come up with new ways of designing these buildings. Um, you can see that in Auburn as well, uh, the amount of technology and heavy equipment that's being used uh, to build those taller buildings is nothing like what it would be if you were building a single story uh, building uh, in the same place. 
So you have to come up with new ways of pumping concrete. Uh, you know, try to imagine the idea of pumping concrete up um, to the 100th floor of a building. Okay, it's hard to imagine how that could possibly be, but in essence, new technology has to be created. It has to be designed. It has to be created. It has to be manufactured in order to go higher. Uh, and every time you go higher, you create uh, more building systems, and more building systems require taking up more space on every single floor. So if you think of the building systems, you're talking about staircases, elevators, escalators, you're talking about air conditioning, you're talking about plumbing, you're talking about electricity, uh, internet cables, uh, all of that. And every time you go up uh, further, you know, the air conditioning ducts have got to get bigger to pump the air higher. Uh, as you go higher, you need more elevator space in order to get people from the bottom to the top in a reasonable fashion. So you can't just do the same old thing. You've got to come up with new ways of doing things. A couple examples of that, a Japanese company came up with a whole new way of doing air conditioning and heating. Instead of big duct works, which would have to be like six feet by six feet wide to pump enough air up to the 100 story, they've come up with a way where instead of, you know, metal uh, vents, they've come up with just a little teeny pipe that's one inch in diameter. And this uh, pipe doesn't contain cold air or hot air. It contains uh, a frigidant that takes heat or cold from one place in the building to another. So you're not pumping it, you know, massive amounts of air. You're pumping up a small amount of refrigerant. And that refrigerant can actually be, go from one floor to the next, and it can actually go from one side of the building to the other. So if you've got one side of the building that's hot and one side of the building that's cold, it can actually move cold air from the cold side to cool off the hot side. And that's almost free heat, basically, or free air conditioning. So they had to come up with something entirely different. And you can imagine going from one floor up to 100 floors, uh, how many elevators you'd need and how much cable would be necessary in order to get that uh, elevator uh, from the bottom to the top and back again. Well, it turns out that the latest round of buildings in excess of 120 stories, uh, a company in Europe came up with an idea uh, that basically they had to. Uh, the cable, the steel cable that was going to be necessary to move those elevators was uh, weighed 22,000 pounds. You get your uh, mind around that. And uh, so all of the energy that would be necessary to just pull the cable up and down would be enormous. And so this European company came up with, was tasked with coming up with a new cable, which they did, which could hold the same and pull the same elevator up 120 stories, but only weighed 2,000 pounds. Okay, so you had, you know, scientists and researchers and engineers working uh, to come up with that advanced technologies, things that we could do but weren't necessarily efficient to do at the present time, uh, but it was necessary to, to facilitate these uh, record-setting buildings. Uh, and so they expended the resources in order to do that. So it's new construction technologies and new building systems. And this is the important point. Record-setting skyscrapers are merely an illustration of what is going on in the economy more broadly. So again, it's not that skyscrapers cause business cycles. That's very important. Most people have actually got that wrong. 
including some of my fellow economists and people in the media. I don't get any respect, basically. <laughs> but hopefully you'll understand it. It's not that skyscrapers cause business cycles, it's just that skyscrapers are an illustration of what's going on in the economy more broadly. So yes, there's new advanced technologies for construction, there's new advanced technologies for building systems, but there's new technologies that are being developed in advance um, that are going on throughout the entire economy. But very often we can't see and identify and separate out all of those things. Okay, so for the housing bubble, because I had been well prepared doing this research on Richard Cantillon and the skyscraper curse and business cycles, uh, I was able to spot the housing bubble uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of them was the new record-setting skyscraper in the Middle East. Uh, but there were also other signs of exuberance in the American economy and stock markets being at record levels and, um, and then, of course, housing prices being extremely high and a lot of housing construction throughout the United States. So I started that with an article on Mises Daily, June 4, 2004. Is the housing bubble popping or topping? August 8, 2005. That's really when the, the top was, actually. Uh, average housing prices in the United States uh, basically topped out around this week, actually. And then I published uh, or wrote the economics of ho uh, the housing bubble, and uh, that was submitted in June, first week of June 2006. It wasn't actually ultimately published until 2009. And then on lourockwell.com on 2007, that's Lou's title. I didn't, I didn't put that title on there. I can't remember what my title was. But it really was, the, with the housing bubble, a lot of Austrians were very aware of the fact of what was going on. And so when we would you know, write an article or give a lecture in public, people were stunned. They couldn't believe it. They wanted to know what I'd been smoking. And... <laughs> Uh, you know, so there was widespread opposition to even saying there might be a housing bubble going on right now. Now, the new record-setting skyscraper um, in the making, August 7th, 07, on the Mises blog regarding the skyscraper curse. And then another LouRockwell.com article, and then another article that was published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. I think this would be something well worth you uh, looking up, getting a copy, and reading, because what I do is I report on what the leaders of the Federal Reserve, the main body that sits in Washington, D.C., what they were saying to the general public in the year 2007. And basically, they thought everything was great in the economy, they told us that, that they were on the scene, they were ever vigilant, they were extremely powerful, and they had every bit of information you could possibly believe. One fellow from the University of Chicago who was in charge of regulating financial markets actually said that credit default swaps, mortgage-backed securities, and the like were a great new invention that they caused uh, liquidity in the markets and they caused transparency in the markets. Those are two things that the Fed just loves to talk about is transparency, which means they show you what they're doing, right? And liquidity means, well, the markets are very large and liquid and so every little event is only gonna have a small effect on the overall economy and of course, those new financial instruments were precisely the reason why the liquidity in the market evaporated and those things were 
the reason why we didn't have any transparency. None of us knew, really, that there was these trillions of dollars of new uh, assets in the economy where banks would take their loans, their mortgages, and package them into tranches so that if you take, you know, say 60% of them and say, you know, this is rated, instead of being rated C or B, this tranche is now going to be rated triple A. And this other tranche will be the first mortgages that will go bad. And so we're going to rate this, uh, you know, unrated or very low rated uh, financial assets. And so that was going on behind the scenes, within the banks, within the uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all that. They were creating these products and telling us that, hey, the banks have got nothing but triple A rated stuff when they actually had less, you know, like triple C rated stuff. So when the Duj, Burj Khalafi Tower, renamed the Burj Dubai in honor of the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi, uh, one person, well, that's, that's the day that the building officially opened, January 8th, 2010, and CNN reports, one person who wasn't surprised by the economic woes greeting the dedication of the tower um, was Auburn University economist Mark Thornton. He predicted tough times for the Emirate two years ago in a blog titled New Record Sky Skyscraper. So I finally got some respect there. <laughs> Unfortunately, that wasn't going to last too long. Um, I, I report on the recent literature, but that's really not terribly important for our purposes here today. It's just that a lot of other people have been writing on this phenomenon. Most uh, notably, a, an economist at, uh, in New Jersey named Jason Barr, uh, and he f is always statistically testing the idea that record-setting skyscrapers are a psychological phenomenon. It's just that, you know, the builder gets it in his head that, why not just go 10 more stories and set a new record? So here's more um, papers by Barr and his co-authors. Okay, and in 2015, he published... Uh, a paper with two of his co-authors, Skyscraper Height and the Business Cycle, Separating Myth from Reality. And then other papers, uh, they find that, therefore, height does not predict cycles. They move together with temporary deviations due to builder competition or the, psycho the psychology of wanting to build the biggest building out there uh, near peaks. Lucas's paper, uh, uh, which is incorporated into my book, well, there is a general consensus in favor of the skyscraper curse. Um, the idea that lower interest rates coincide with economic expansions, higher stock prices, and skyscraper construction. Some authors try to expand this analysis to other variables, uh, but there's all, there still is a general consensus here regarding the skyscraper curse. Okay, the reporting on my paper, Loeffler's paper believes that optimism in the economy leads to this building. Uh, Barr believes that builder competition social status and ego are the reasons people build these record-setting skyscrapers. So this brings us to a very important methodological point. Austrians do not deny psychological factors, particularly in business cycles. But we ex expect to be able to explain why the psychology has changed. And Keynesians don't explain the change in psychology, they just say it's there, and then use that as a causal factor. Austrians use an economic variable, the interest rate, to show that those low interest rates make everything more profitable, at least temporarily. So everybody's making money, everybody's got a job, everybody's filling up their 401k, everybody's buying toys, boats, 
uh, in all sorts of things. So yes, when artificially low interest rates goose the economic uh, economy, people do become more optimistic and more speculative in their economic activities. And yes, I mean, once the uh, crisis starts and everything goes bad, everybody's losing money, stock prices are going down, land prices are going down, uh, people are losing their jobs, people are going bankrupt. It's not surprising that the psychology of people, the social mood, turns negative. So we don't deny psychological factors. We try to explain them. And the best way to explain social psychology is the interest rate. Okay, so Barr et al. 2015. Okay, he's, he's referring to psychological factors such as builder competition, uh, social status, and ego. Um, and uh, so they, for two reasons, they say the skyscraper curse doesn't work. Um, so one is that psychological factors played a role, and the other is date of announcements and date of opening of these record setters does not empirically fit the pattern of changes in GDP growth. Third, he actually showed empirically that skyscrapers do not curse, but that some third factor or factors causes both skyscrapers and curses. You know, it's hard to believe that he could write this paper if he had seen my paper, and he must have seen it. So I have to wonder about uh, where he's coming from here. First of all, as I just mentioned, uh, we don't deny psychology. We embed it in our Austrian business cycle theory. Second of all, neither Andrew Lawrence nor myself said that there's any precision with respect to announcement dates, uh, construction start dates, opening dates, completion dates. Uh, there's a lot of dates surrounding these things, but there's nothing that you would expect to be causally related because, again, the skyscraper curse, the skyscraper does not cause the business cycle. In fact, it, what it says at the bottom, skyscrapers do not curse, but some third factor or factors cause both. Hmm, I wonder what that could have been. <laughs> again, he's written, you know, many, many papers on the subject and uh, is yet to uh, see the light. Um, so we tried to change his mind on that. We wrote, Lucas and I wrote a uh, comment for his paper in the same journal, and uh, they didn't accept it. And uh, it turns out he was one of the referees of the comment. <laughs> Unbelievable. I feel like someday I'm going to turn in the mirror and see Rodney Dangerfield. Okay, so um, basically these are all the reasons um, why Barr's paper is wrong. Uh, he basically, uh, he more or less proved the skyscraper curse by using this Granger causality test and, and some other econometric uh, testing to show that Skyscraper curse does not cause the business cycle. It's some other third factor. So on March 28, 2015, The Economist ran the following uh, editorial. Quote, if as the skyscraper curse suggests, the decision to build the biggest towers happens near the peak of the business cycle, then you could use record-breaking projects to predict the future path of GDP. However, the range of months between the announcement and, of the towers and the business cycle peak is large, varying from zero to 45 months. And only seven of the 14 open during a downward phase of the business cycle. See the chart. In other words, you cannot accurately forecast a recession or financial panic by looking at either the announcement or the completion of the world's tallest buildings. And then this right here is the chart, which you know, basically shows that the skyscraper and the economic crisis in orange 
line up pretty darn good. As a matter of fact, this crisis <coughs> sits right in between the towers. Uh, these are the World Trade Towers and the Sears Tower. And then, of course, the oil shock in the beginning of the stagflation of the 1970s. And then you go back to the Great Depression, where they had the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building. There was another record as well here. Um, and, uh, of course, it lines up with the beginning of the Great Depression. This is just the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, the unemployment rate when the Empire State Building opened was 25%. And, of course, it continued um, for the next 10 or so years. And then the panic of 1907 here lines up very well with the Singer Building, uh, 186 meters in New York, opening in 1908. Also, the Metropolitan Life Building also set a record um, at about the same time. So that's their, that's their proof that there is no skyscraper curse, which is... Um, which is hard to believe. Uh, thank you very much.